because I've spoken to to you guys a lot about what I've been thinking lately with the, the modern man. <laughs> kind of the way I see things going in, in today's day and age, I think there's a lack of like a good example on, on what a man should be. I think a lot of boys mm -hmm. are lost nowadays in terms of what does it be, mean to be a man and kind of uh, aspire to that next level. I think naturally as boys, we look for a purpose. We look for something to, to live for. And I feel like it's getting harder and harder to kind of find those examples. So I think it's interesting to talk about the coming of age, talk about protecting what you love, and, and really how history has put us to this point right here. So first question I'd say for us to talk about is, what do you think a modern man is? Hmm. Boom, on the spot. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, a modern man. You know, I was uh, I was talking to my wife the other day, and 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 you know, her concept was modern man is is different today than what it used to be, right? And I think uh, when you look at how the world's kind of changed, you know, is a modern man still a gentleman? You know, is it still one that does does take the lead in a home, right? Does take the lead outside of the home? Uh, anywhere from just, you know, opening the door. Um, but I think also with, uh, I think women becoming more independent too, right? I think sometimes it's maybe as men, it's brought us back a little bit from being being that gentleman. Um, and I think, you know, we still got to hold doors. We still got to take the lead. We still have to be decision makers. Um, it, not taking in anything away from women because you know they're going to be independent women then there's going to be women that take control women that that don't but i think as men the modern day man i think has become a little more maybe feminine in different aspects i mean i'm an artist so as an artist i have my feminine side of me too right and um i guess that modern man to me is is you still want to be more of a rah, 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 you know like yeah i'm a man and you know, I got muscles and I'm, I'm, I'm the head of the household. So I guess to me, a modern man is, is it continually changes, right? That's my two cents for right now. It's interesting. So two weeks ago, I was on this podcast and it's like a female entrepreneurial podcast. It's called, the, it's for this badassery magazine. And they started asking these questions and all of them were gender related. And it completely caught me off guard because it's not something I've talked a lot about. Uh, but it was a very interesting conversation because when you think about this idea of, I mean, I've got a podcast called The Breadwinner Podcast. And when you say the word breadwinner, 99% of people are thinking, man, right? But with this movement of women like becoming more independent and just doing more things, it's interesting to think about what it means to be a modern man in that environment. So things that I was mentioning on that podcast was that, like my wife, she's starting a business right now. And we have an uh, almost two-year-old. And it's been humbling to watch her have to deal with our two-year-old and start a business, and I leave and go to work. And sometimes that doesn't feel right, right? Like I'm leaving in the morning, daughter's going crazy. Bye, honey, see you later. I go off to the office. She's still trying to run a business, but you've got this daughter running around going crazy. And so I think it seems to me that, that part of this idea of being a modern man is taking over some of those responsibilities that traditionally men just didn't handle. Now saying that, that's not easy. <laughs> because as I'm saying that, I'm like, damn, that sucks. <laughs> because it's difficult, right? Like it's difficult anytime there's change involved. Um, but to me, being a modern man is, is someone that is um, open to change, I believe. Um, and my idea of just a man in general is a person that's willing to go all in in all areas. So whether it's with your family, your relationships, whether it's professionally, whether it's your body, whether it's your mind, whatever it is, to be able to go all in in all those areas and whatever area that you're currently, whatever environment you're currently in, be fully present um, to me is super important um, to, to be able to call yourself a man. There's a lot of men um, that go to work, they come home and they're there, but they're not really present. They're not really available. Um, and I think that there's something wrong with that. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that they're not really all in at work. And so when they get home, they're really not, they don't have the capacity to be all in. Uh, so to me, like 
for my life and being a man, I try to be all in in all areas, and that is transitioning and more to those roles of, you know, helping out with a child, um, which I think will be some interesting conversation um, coming from the three of us <laughs> that have that have kids uh, and, and how to balance that because it is a, a balancing act for sure. So that's that past look. I saw that look. <laughs> it is passive. Well, first off, I want to. Them shoes, man. Whew. The camo, the j Ooh, the Nickies. Uh, uh, but um, what is a man? A man, and that—that's something that's that's not defined other than by genitalia, you know. So, what is a man though in in the middle state? Uh, uh, I, I told you guys before I had the idea about the new alpha. What is alpha? But even being an alpha male versus a bravo male, that doesn't make you more of a man. It's just a mindset, it's the way you act. So I've taken that concept away and just thought about what is, what's, what makes a man. If you want to be a man, you maximize your household. What is your household? So, and how do you maximize it? Maybe, you know what, if your wife can make $500,000 a year if you take care of the kid, maybe you need to take care of a kid you know if if there's there's always a different concept uh, my current girlfriend she runs a horse farm so if we decided to have a kid later if we decide to do that should i tell her well you can't run your horse farm you gotta take care of the kid and i'm gonna take that money away from the household is that is that sensible well that's a very easy example but that's sensible so it is it's a man who thinks and maximizes the household the whole new alpha idea was kind of based on that premise but it's the idea that is it the loudest most brawly guy in the room who yeah he gets all that that face attention they want to see you they want to look at you or is the guy who's in the corner is like well i can talk to him i can buy him a drink and i can get him to go over here and do this this and this and this for me it's who controls the arena and specifically as a man, one thing that has never changed on the definition of a man is your family, your household, that's yours. You take care of that. Now, it being yours may not be on, as you said, it may not be on the breadwinner. It may be on the caregiver, but I control the ideas, I control the emotions, you know, I control what goes on in my four walls. When my wife leaves, she knows well, I'm gonna do this because me and her talked about that. And, I, and, and you know, I got her to understand, hey babe, we, we gotta do this. Now I'm willing to stay home and do this part if you're willing to go out and do that part. And it's always a negotiation. Because in, in all honesty, any real beast of a man doesn't want a docile woman. You don't want a woman that doesn't understand the universe. You don't, woman, you don't want a woman that doesn't understand what's gonna happen if, if something happens to you. Because that's your biggest fear. What if something happens to you? What's she gonna do? She needs, you want a woman that's gonna handle business. Start to finish. If you're in the hospital, she's gonna take care of it. I, I'm good. Are you worried about paying bills or sick? Nope, she's got it. Everything's good. So that idea of, it's maximizing your household. Because if you have a woman that's very docile, she wants to take care of his kids, she wants to stay home, there's nothing wrong with that. But you know, you're the breadwinner. That's what you do. And you, as a male, as, as being uh, the head of household, if you want to speak, it's understanding all the roles, boom, 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 boom. It's like having a company with 100 people, you have to know who to put where. And it's not always the smartest role to put yourself in the breadwinner spot. Because that may not be where you can best serve the community. In that case, the community is your family. So that's my thought, is, is the modern male is Who's the one that can understand, adapt, and you know, there's other aspects. There's a physical aspect, which is no excuse for anyone. You gotta be able to, you gotta be able to get it done. You gotta be able to move around. If Walking Dead happens, we, <laughs> you gotta keep that light jump. <laughs> yeah. I think it's interesting because each one of us, uh, each one of us mentioned when we talk about the modern man, our significant other, and the family, the people around us, and that's kind of what. I touched on purpose, being something bigger than ourselves. In each one of your descriptions, you mention the wife, the kids, and I think being a man is, <laughs> is being needed. 
And mm -hmm. we could talk about uh, the problem nowadays when we talk about the modern man, the suicide rate amongst men is three to four times more than women. Mm -hmm. So obviously nowadays, men aren't feeling needed, men aren't feeling fulfilled. So if, if that's the problem, what do you guys think some solutions, and this is open forum, um, what do you guys think are some solutions for men to feel fulfilled, for men to take responsibility of their lives, whether they're single, have a girlfriend, engaged, or married with, chil with children? Uh, I think that's kind of a solution that can kind of help men push forward. Dude, I think you said the word right there, responsibility. It's not your wife's or your girlfriend's responsibility to make you happy. It's your responsibility to make you happy. And the byproduct of doing so will be a happier relationship. I think there's so many people that get upset and they get depressed because they're not happy, but they're looking to other people like, she needs to be fixed. And there's something wrong with her and she's not doing this and she's not doing that. And they don't look internal. And that's just personal responsibility to me. Um, the lack of personal responsibility is the biggest cancer in our society, period, period. And it's that whole analogy we've all heard a million times with the cabin pressure dropping in the airplane and the oxygen mass falls. And people hear that and they're like, yeah, 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 of course, put it on first and then you can help the others. But people don't realize when that's, when that's really happening, like if you don't do that, you die. <laughs> like you, you die. And it is easy to say in theory, like, yeah, of course you put your oxygen mask on first. But when it's in real life, it's not that easy. It's not that black and white. Um, but it's not until you take care of yourself, and in that case, being your happiness, that you have the capacity to, to take care of anyone else. Like, until you're happy, you can't make anybody else happy. Uh, but I think there's so many people that are relying on others for their own happiness, and they'll never be able to fill themselves that way. You, you, you talk about happiness. To me, my, you know, people say, you know, the, I, I guess the, the quote is, what makes you happy, right? And to me, there's a difference between happiness and joy, mm -hmm. right? I know for me, my son, my family, my wife, it brings me pure joy, right? Um, happiness is an outward thing. I think joy is an inward thing. Hmm. And um, you also talked about responsibility. I think as a man, you, we do have to take responsibility. I think this day and age too, we have, there's a lack of men that take responsibility for themselves, yeah. for their families. Um, and, f and for others, um, but I also think pressure, you talk about suicide, you know, when you have so much pressure on you to provide, to take care of, to be responsible, those pressures sometimes can get in the way. You know, I'm a man of faith and I believe, I believe God can bring you through anything, mm -hmm. and uh, I think suicide is one of them, you know. I don't have the answers when it comes to suicide, because I don't know, I, I used to always think it was very selfish, and I think to an, to an extent it still is selfish, but I know a lot of people that have lost loved ones that have, you know, killed themselves. And um, it's a touchy subject. And, and I think it comes back to the point of being a man, when you're on the street or you're in a new city and you see someone that's just in need or down, I mean, just a simple hello, a hel you know, a, a smile yeah. to someone can make a difference in their day. Um, and you never know what someone's going through. It's really taught me a lot lately about just people in your lives that you can, um, I guess, just ask questions and, and, and talk to more, you know, because we all get busy with our lives. And I think it's important as men to, to be friends, right? Be brothers, yeah. um, be husbands. And uh, I, I think if we t really find that true joy inside, I don't think suicide can really come attack us because it, it starts within not trying to find all this stuff from the outward appearance, you know? And, you know, I've seen the ups and downs of life. You know, success, money doesn't make you happy. Um, that internal joy is really what's gonna bring you true happiness. Hmm. Hope that makes sense. Yeah. Man, it, it makes a lot of sense. It, it's funny, like, listening to you guys, it's like skipping a rock across the lake. And it goes from spot to spot, because there was things that I was thinking and you just, you thought of, I was late because I was in church. And I was about to walk out, and I never leave church early. That's, that's, that's a, a personal rule, man. I was about to walk out, and a guy walked up the front to join the church. And my kids, my kids even said, they're like, hey, Pops, we can't leave now. I'm like, you know what? No, we can't leave. We let this man join the church, let him feel good, then we'll slide, then, then we'll go. 
Um, but one thing, you know, and uh, I got a video I want to send you, so please remind me later. Uh, so, what, what's this, how's the song go? Big boys don't what? So we're not allowed to cry. We're taught that. And every era of the newer generation, as I've, I've educated myself and tried to think about it, it's actually the fault of the older generation. Because I'm modeling my kids. Like, my kids got some errors, bro. I'll tell you flat out. They're, gr they're great kids overall, but they got some errors. I told them today, I'm like, y'all gonna struggle as adults for the first few years. And I was pissed off. But you know who I'm really pissed off at? It's my fault. Because there's some certain things that I have done incorrectly. And you know what? I, I was blessed to have twins, so I got a double lesson at once. If I have another kid, eh, maybe, maybe not. That's not my thing, but I see what I did. I see it. I know what I did wrong. So when we're talking to these people, because everybody's not the same, we down, we down guys that are sensitive when we're younger. You don't play football, you don't hit, you don't kick. We downplay those people, but those are people as they are made, as they live. That doesn't mean they're not men. That's archaic. The thought process that we are putting into these young men has to change. If you have a problem, don't eat it. Come talk to me. My big thing, like, and I'm sure we all have our, our charitable thought processes, our charitable moves, our charitable thoughts, is the senior to junior in high school to 25. Who takes care of those guys? Who are in the worst positions ever? You are about to be a real man. Who talks to those guys? Who takes those guys in? Who, who grabs that kid that's, hey man, I want to start this business, no clue what I'm doing. Because you can tell them they're motivated. You can motivate them, you gotta hustle, hustle, hustle. Okay, I'm willing to hustle, but what do I do? Hey man, I'm having a hard time, my family's messed up, what do I do? We taught them, you're a man, suck it up. That's, that's our society. And it's so bass backwards. That's not how it should be, because we realize that through genetics, through periods of time, there's a million different types of men. It's just like, you know, on the side I personal train a few guys. I do not train this guy the way I train this guy. Why? Because it doesn't, the same thing doesn't work for everybody. We need to make it okay for men to be upset. Now maybe, no, I'm not saying you gotta run out in the street crying. Come talk to me, man. You can cry, it's okay. But when you're done crying, let's talk about it. Why are you crying? What's wrong? Let's fix it. But as, as fathers, don't we also, with our children, I know with my child, I don't want him to cry, right? I tell him, okay, you need to stop crying now. You know, whether he's hurt or he's fake crying or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but in the great words of Will Smith, right? Um, uh, how's he say it? Um, you can cry, there ain't no shame in it, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's not shame in crying, right? There's not shame, but you, like you said, we are taught to, to be men. You know, don't don't let that. So, it's just like, tell me you haven't seen this example. A kid falls. I literally have to grab for back in the day their mother, whatever. I have to grab everyone. Don't say anything, because if you freak out, he's gonna cry, and now it's not okay. And I don't want that. I want to be tough. So, but over the years, I've had some. Lucky, unlucky experiences. I was raised by my grandfather. So when he died, oh, I lost it for like two days straight. And my kids sit right next to me and got to watch me lose it. Like boohooing, breaking down. And I think back at that moment, I'm like, that was okay. They, they, they got to see it. Because if we keep commanding them to be tough, rough, rugged, dude, there's a reason only 1% of the universe plays football. There's a reason. It's not everybody. So when you define the man, it's about maximizing your situation, taking care of your clan. My clan isn't your clan, isn't your clan, isn't your clan. We're just different, but that's, that's okay. Yeah. okay. I think this is a funny to topic here because I think when we talk about being men, we want to talk about being emotionally available and having the, the freedom and the ability to feel the ability to, to cry and, and really have like a group of men or someone you can go to and say, hey, 
this is hard, this isn't working for me, I don't know what's going on in my business, at work, in my household, having someone you could be vulnerable with, mm -hmm. but on the other side of that coin, we, we kind of think men are, are the, the last line of defense for their household. They're the last line of defense for what they've built. Mm -hmm. So it, it can almost come across a little oxymoronic. Yeah. To be like, hey, can I, can I interject on you a little? But you have to be vulnerable. Yeah. You're the first line of defense. Don't nothing. And maybe that's different, because I saw both of them shake their heads up and down. We have kids. Yeah. We're, I'm line of defense number one. If something happens to my kid, Mama, you go take care of them. I'm keeping the crowd away. Whatever is required. We're the first line of defense. But what good is the first line of defense? Because that's who goes first. So if the rest of your team is, is weak or isn't strong, and that's what we're missing, man. We're missing the building the team, which is what we all talked about with the, the spouses and the growth. You, you know, you just touched on, to me, when you talk about first line of defense too, I also think about as fathers, you know, maybe there's there's some of us as fathers that we don't love enough, right? Because the mother is the one that's supposed to be the loving caretaker, right? Yeah. The husband's supposed to be the supporter, uh, the uh, you know, the provider, uh, the protector, right? Oh, general. Yeah, but <laughs> but you think of uh, you know back to a modern man. You know, to me, a man is someone that is loving and caring. You know, you can still be a big man, a macho man, right? And still love. Um, and back to the other topic of, of suicide. Like if we love people more, like I've been learning about loving just the last few years, because our tempers can get in the way a lot of time. Yeah. I know mine can, and it has. And I've learned that, hey, I just gotta love people more. Um, and it can change a mindset, it can change a heart, you know? And uh, I just think, I just think if fathers love more um, and cared about their children, you know, we could build a, be a better generation coming up. Yeah. Um, the interesting thing though is I don't think it's, a, I don't think it's if fathers love more, I think it's if fathers showed the love that they have more, because they've got it. You're right, you're right. They're exactly. just afraid to show it, don't know how to show it. Um, and I think it's, quite frankly, I think it's an epidemic. When you talk about suicide, the reality is, as men, you walk around, hey man, how you doing? Great. How you doing? Good. How you doing? Can't complain. Meanwhile, they're cheating on their wives, their kids hate them, their business is barely staying afloat. Mm -hmm. But they put on this like front, like they're this alpha male, like nothing can stop me, like I'm not going to let anyone know all the terrible stuff going on. And that's when that stuff just boils to the top and then they get to that place where they're like, I shouldn't be here. I, my kids would be better off if I was not here. My wife would be better off mm -hmm. if I was not here. And so you have to be able to create space for people. And you can do that by being vulnerable yourself. I mean, that's something I've just become extremely passionate about, is that vulnerability is the ultimate form. Uh, Dude, and that's the thing. Like, you say, like, you know, I watch the podcast, I hear you, but you take it one up. Being vulnerable is the start. Don't be afraid to reach out. Because there are people here, and we take that as a level of weakness. But I'll say like this, like, I moved, I lived in Germany for 10 years. I moved back right at the same time Ted moved, came to Greenville. Happened to get linked up, and, and we've been stuck with each other ever since. But dude, if something is wrong, I think one thing that we found is, I'm very good at telling Ted, hey man, this is wrong. And he tells me, hey bro, this is not going the way I want. From business, to relationships, to children, to everything, don't be afraid to ask someone else. You know, one thing, uh, that's my boy, Steve Harvey's my boy, and I'll, I'll give him this credit. I listen to him in the morning at six o'clock whenever I can, but he said, without no test, you have no testimony. You can't tell someone else how to do something if you've never been through it. I mean, you might have an outline, but unless you've ever really done it, or you lived through it, or you survived it, you can't tell them. So what men really are supposed to do is to seek out someone else who has done it. Uh, I tell my kids, like, they're, they're athletes and they're cocky, man. Oh my goodness, I, uh, yeah, man. They're cocky little dudes. And, uh, but one thing, I, I preach this, I preach this, I preach this. I'm like, so this guy, he's 80 years old. 
and you don't want to listen to him for four hours. But if you listen to him, he's going to tell you that one thing to change your game that's going to save you two years of figuring it out on your own. And I preach that to them repetitively about sports. I'm a big sports proponent, not for being a meathead, but for what it teaches you for life. Um, but it's, it's the, it's not the vulnerability, but that's the start. Yeah. It's the next part. It's like, okay, I'm about to mess up. My business is going under. Who's gonna call you? You're intimidating, man. I'm not calling you. You are crushing it. Ah, uh, dude, I can't get you. Uh, I can't get Ted. He's on TV. Uh, uh, nah, Charles looks like the, he got a couple. I'm just gonna sit here and struggle. So maybe as men on, there's not a who, who are doing it. Maybe we gotta open those doors up a little more. Like, hey, I'm a accountability yeah and that's because that's what's all about it's about giving back I, I, I'm constantly looking for that 23 24 year old guy who's trying to do something but he just doesn't know the ins and outs but why, but why you don't why you don't like you just said you looked at each of us and said the reasons you weren't gonna call us right yeah. and a lot of it's pride right yeah is our pride is not you know we got to break our pride down a little bit I mean look at the fall of almost Ooh. Any man, right? Yeah. Is their pride. Pride. If we can break that down, I mean, we all want to be proud, right? But there's a difference in being proud and being proud full, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. Or boastful. Which the question is, where do men today go to be vulnerable? Where, where can you go for that outlet? I, you know, I go, I go to my, I go to my wife, mm -hmm. right? You know, sometimes it's. You can say you don't want to tell your wife certain things, but for me, I think uh, communication is key, especially in a marriage. Mm -hmm. um, but I know I can be very vulnerable with my wife because I, I trust her and I know she loves me, right? Mm -hmm. And then I also have a few friends that I know I can share anything with, so I know if I'm down and out, she's, of course, my best friend, so I can tell her anything, but I have friends that I can call and say, man, I'm really struggling like with this, or I'm struggling with pride, or I'm struggling with... Um, you know, work or whatever it may be, right? And that's a good point you made there with having your wife and some friends. Because mm -hmm. I think if, if you're spending your life with somebody, it's important to be vulnerable with that person. Right. But when that person is kind of who you're having an issue with, who else do you go to? Yeah. I was reading about a study where they say most men, their main go-to for emotional support is their wife. Mm -hmm. yeah. But for women, they tend to more often than not have a group of friends that they can kind of rely on. Right. And a lot of times as men, the burdens that we take on can be huge. They can be big. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot to put onto one person mm -hmm. because your wife, your girlfriend, fiance or whatever has their set of problems too. So you don't want to necessarily burden them with your whole load. Right. So to have a network, <laughs> to have some other men who you, you trust and you can kind of the way I put it with my girlfriend all the time is when I'm out in the, in the world, everybody knows Ted Fate. They know me and my hard shell. But when I come home, that shell is open and you can see my yoke, right? right? You, you can see the soft parts of who I am because in the world, there's going to be that shell, but I can't be that shell if I can't open up and, and share the inner soft spots with my, with my girlfriend, with my friends, and those people. Mm -hmm. And it's really those people that facilitate the yoke, who take care of the inside, that allows this outside shell mm -hmm. to be so rigid. Because at the end of the day, we can't deny the fact that there are dangers in this world. And as men that have things to protect, someone's gonna try and take what we have. Yeah. And we're gonna have to be able to protect that too. Sure. I, like, I, I, I love how you said that. You're right. I think friends are key. With friends that you can trust and you can open up to, I think mm -hmm. it's very but important. But it's through that it's through that vulnerability that you give somebody the audacity to share their stuff. Yeah. Like every conversation that I've had lately that's that's gotten super deep, it was by me first sharing something vulnerable. And then it let them open up a little bit and, and share something to theirs. Then it's kind of back and forth. But until I shared that, that conversation wouldn't have gone in that direction. You know what I mean? Um, so to me, it's just about living in truth. Uh, I did a podcast with this guy um, who now I hired as a coach. Uh, his name's Sean Whalen. 
and I had him on the podcast and I asked, hey, what's one thing you quit doing that enables you to succeed? It's like a question I always ask these people. And he said, lying. I said, about what? He said, everything. I was like, jeez. <laughs> He's like, everything. He's like, I lied to, to everyone about everything. And it was just that idea, that whole thing. Like, yeah, I'm doing great, doing great. How are you? I'm fine, great, awesome. And he had a gun in his mouth one night and, and realized that like none of this stuff matters. It's all about living in truth. And there's a, that's a lot to unpack. Um, but this idea of, of not just living in truth when it's comfortable, but always telling the truth. And so with a lot of my content lately that we've been putting out, like I've been exposing a lot of stuff uh, about myself that hasn't been comfortable uh, to put out there. But by doing so, now the messages that I'm receiving, now the conversations that I'm having with people are so much more real and so much more impactful. Um, and there's this concept I keep talking about lately, I can't stop talking about it. It's the idea that you can drown in three inches of water. And that's where 99% of people live. That's where all the social media lives, basically. Mm. That's where everybody else lives. There's three inches of water. Nobody's ever going deep with one another. It's just this small talk BS and they part their separate ways. And so my goal now is just to go as deep as I can with people. Um, like when you walked into the office, yeah. you know, you walked in, I'm like, hey, what's up, man? We sat down and all of a sudden just went deep, like immediately. <laughs> yeah. Because I was like, no one has time for small talk. Like, I don't, you know, like, hey, how's it going? Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see. Yeah, cool, cool. Yeah, see you later. We talked about some deep topics, you know. Which, to your point, the when when you opened up and shared, it was almost like, oh, hey, here. It's it's one thing to be like, hey, I'm Tyler, to be like, hey, I'm yeah. Tyler, and then in that regard, you end up mirroring the person you're talking to, exactly. and and with that wall falling down, it's like, hey, my wall's down too, and we mm -hmm. end up going. So, yeah. do you think, as men, we do away with that shell? I don't necessarily think that you're doing away with it. I think it's you're giving people the uh, you're giving people the opportunity to get through it. Yeah. It's and you can and you can and a lot of times a lot of times you can tell, but sometimes you have no clue the person sitting across from you what they're going through mm -hmm. in that moment. And I think by offering that little bit of vulnerability on your end gives them that chance that they may actually be like, you know what, I'm actually going through this right now. And all of a sudden, it just when it unloads, it unloads <laughs> very fast, uh, usually. Uh, but that's what I found lately. It's just like you never know what someone's going through, um, and it's shocking sometimes. But they're just holding this stuff in. They're just sweeping it under the rug, and they're just walking around with all this stuff bottled up because no one's creating space. And I think that's this idea of creating space, creating space, creating space. And that's what we're talking about: is where is that space? Like, where do you go to to have that space to be able to talk about real stuff? Um, and be transparent, and it's it's not a, it's not a normal everyday thing that, that, that people have access to. Yeah, well, before you and before you slide off this topic, if you choose to, I think the conversation is great right now because we're addressing something that nobody addresses. And addressing stuff is great, but one thing like I have a lot of very close conversations about is everybody offers motivation, everybody offers these big band ideas. And you can get a crowd riled up with a big man idea or with being motivated. But no one offers and or creates solutions. So while we're on camera, I just like to throw out a little challenge that maybe we create a solution or start the idea of creating a solution. That being so, just just I'm just throwing that out there. And I actually said it, so somebody might have to do it. Um, so the other part is though, there isn't a solution, man. Like, it, it, there's not. Right now, it doesn't exist. Because one side of it says, we need to open up. All right, so what if I open up? Or do I need to physically reach out and grab someone and pull them in? And then there's the, it sounds horrible, but I think you'll all understand what I'm saying, who's worth pulling in. If I reach out and grab you and pull you in and help you, are you gonna give me everything you've got to get there? Who's worth pulling in? That's hard to, that's hard to understand. But there's just a different thought process of, you know, there is 100%. Like, once I start telling you about my life, then you're, well, it's like kids sharing toys. You can't get this Transformer. I got this He-Man. Yeah, you can get that Transformer. It's kids sharing toys. It's the most basic mind, or, yeah, it's the most basic thought processes. We've been doing this since we were kids. I trust you because you trust me. Who's gonna go first? We're gunslingers. Who's gonna go first? It is the most basic thing. 
that's why it's great. I see your social media is great. You're opening up, but people don't know you. They don't know if you're being for real. That's why it's great. I read the one you put up about not drinking. I, that that actually, I watched it on accident, and that's actually why I started watching your podcast. I'm like, oh, he's for real. Like, that's not something you just say. He's for real. I don't know Jared like that, but me and Ted have real conversations. Like, and I and I have, and I'll tell Ted just as much as I'm asking, hey buddy, I think I'm doing this wrong. I will tell Ted, you know, I, I think I'm doing this wrong. Exactly. Oh, it's check the checker. Hey buddy, that ain't it. And I can tell you because I've done it, and that's not it. So man, it's. It's a great symbiotic relationship in that case, but I feel like it's just that making vulnerability, step one, and step two, asking, being willing to ask for help. Because none of us wanna walk in the building, Ted, what's up, Jared, what's up, Tyler, what's up, Charles, how you doing, man, I'm killing it. Knowing that I'm one paycheck away from losing everything, I, I can't, as a man in this society, I can't tell you that, but maybe you're the guy, you may even need my service. And if I were to say it to you, like, you know what, I got a job coming up. It's a big job, but I know you, I know your skill set. let's talk about it. Maybe the answer is like this close, everybody sees the, the, the meme of the guy hacking through the dirt, it's on their side, he turns around, but that's it in this case. But it needs to become okay to ask for help. Okay to not be okay. Yeah. yeah. Which, so we talk about going for the solution and looking for the solution, right? And I think that group of men bonding is a solution because what we've all mentioned, aside from having our wives or girlfriends to talk to, is having a group of friends. Well, how do you build that friendship through bond? And how do you build the bond? Oftentimes, I mean, I, as men, I'm sure we could all say we've, we've built a bond with another man either by honestly going through some shit together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whether we're working out in the gym, whether we're having our hardships with a business or we go to battle together or anything like that. Or to be honest, I remember in high school, freshman year, this one kid, every time I got on the bus, I was this little, little timid kid freshman year and he would always make fun of me. Made fun of me freshman year, ignored him. Made fun of me sophomore year, ignored him. Made fun of me junior year, finally just got mad. I snapped. On the bus, we just started fighting. Pushed him up against the window, pushed me up against the window. We just went at it. Never made fun of me again. Instead of the, what's going on, Teddy? Turned into, uh, what's up, Ted? <laughs> Literally just combating him, letting him know mm -hmm. I'm not gonna take this anymore. And you know, he hit me a few good times. I hit him a good, few good times. But after we fought, it was done. So the hardships, whether it's through battle and having that, that camaraderie, men actually coming together and being men, boys will be boys, right? They get physical, yeah. they fight. I feel like that masculinity is actually important. The competitiveness in us mm -hmm. is important. We'll be at the gym and Charles, we're running up and down steps. He's like 10 steps and these, these aren't easy. We're on like number four or five and Charles is a half a lap in front of me and he comes down the steps and says, Ted, you're getting drugged by an old man. <laughs> <laughs> I don't take offense. I, I, I got angry, but not at him. I got angry at myself. Yeah, yeah. What did that do? Let me close the gap a little bit. But I think, don't lie, you ain't close no gap. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, your age is gonna catch up to you soon. My youth will kind of be catalyst. <laughs> but I think, so, I do want to talk about that solution in terms of setting up or having a group of men come together using that masculinity for good. Because I think the masculinity in our day-to-day -day world, we can't walk into our house with our girlfriend oh, and like get all that <laughs> aggression out. But I think as men, we have that. Yeah. And we need to get it out, but channel it in a, in a good, good, productive way. Yeah, and the, and the help has to be the help now. The help you know, I ain't gonna ask you how to swim. I'm not gonna ask you that. I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not gonna ask you, I'm trying to be a quarterback, I'm not gonna ask you how to play quarterback. I'm not gonna ask you how to, how to improve my vertical leap. It's just like, you should be vulnerable to your partner, 
But your partner has to understand if you're not vulnerable with her about certain things. And even if you are, you might not, you're my support system. I love you, baby. This is what's going on. It's like, and all I really need from you is a hug and to say, baby, you got it. And maybe if you know someone who knows this thing that I'm going through, especially when it's business related. Hey, but you know, my, my friend such and such, she does this or she does that. That's what I need. Because the problem is you have to go to the solution, the right solution. Don't just, you know, go out there flapping the wind. When people come to me for business consulting, for instance, I had a guy come the other day. I was like, yeah, you need a, a non-disclosure agreement. Oh, so you write that? No. I made about six phone calls. I'm like, here's the, ex the person of expertise in that area for you. You need to get with her ASAP before you talk to this person on Monday. Who you want to interview about working for you? Let's do that first. Just small stuff. But that's the overall problem. What area are you having a problem in? If you're, where do you go? Don't just grab. Go where you need to go to fix your problem. Because we all don't have the same problem. It's, we're all wired amazingly differently, which is what makes us great. It's, it's, it's what me, makes me like to watch you paint. It's what makes me listen to your podcast. Actually, it's what makes me like to watch Ted do live MC gigs. That's my favorite. He, he, he's, hey, he's better live than he is on air. It's, it's, it's a, no, no, like live Ted is, is something else. You might get a couple dance moves. You never know what you're going to get. But it's the thing. It's, we're wired different. But to be able to find that thing, to have that network, or to be able to plug in to that network of positivity and growth, and people who actually are willing to be a little bit available. We've all got time, we've all got to make money, we've all got to have jobs, understood. But to be able to plug into that network of positivity where we need help. If you need help starting a business, maybe you're an entrepreneur, you're an individual business, that's one area. Maybe you have a business and you're trying to change culture. That's another thing. All these things are different, but where do you find help? Because I know I need help, but where do I find it? Dude, If if you could create that light bulb of, of help and make it okay to grab it, that'd be amazing. One thing that you said a second ago, we talked about going out and grabbing that person and bringing them in. There's this idea of being a lighthouse versus a tugboat. And you were talking about being a tugboat. And there's a reason, there's a reason why tugboat engines burn out very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. But man, I've been so intrigued by this concept of being a lighthouse, especially when you talk about under the umbrella of truth and just shining. And it's not the lighthouse's job to decide whether each individual boat follows this direction. It's just the lighthouse's job to sit there and shine, right? And you see lighthouses, they're there for hundreds of years. People freaking go and visit lighthouses and take pictures of them and they're there forever. <laughs> but when you really try to start embodying what does that mean for me to be a lighthouse in my industry, in my home, in my community? Um, what does that actually look like? And again, starting with vulnerability, but then leading by example and all those different things that come with, with being a, really a leader, that concept of the difference between the lighthouse, because you can try all day. This guy looks like he needs, he needs help. I'm gonna go help him. I'm gonna go help her. I'm gonna go help him. I'm gonna go help her. And all you'll end up doing at the end of the day is exhausting yourself. Mm. But just by being able to stand and provide an example for others, to me, is the way I want to try to live you know, my life. Uh, but basing that in truth. And by expressing that vulnerability, expressing those truths that are uncomfortable, uh, and giving other people the audacity to do the same thing. And those other people, just through the law of attraction, like they'll come to you. You don't have to go grab them. Like those right people, like those 23, 24 year olds that need it. When you're setting that example and you're putting your stuff out there, they'll come to you, you know, they're coming to you. And then you know, okay, this is one that's worth spending all my time with because our time is so freaking valuable. Um, most, most valuable. Um, that to me, I think has been the biggest breakthrough I've seen over the last few months, just through the law of attraction by just embodying truth from that lighthouse perspective and seeing the relationships that have popped up just like out of nowhere. Um, say out of nowhere, but when it happens, you're like, oh, that, that, that makes sense, like that checks out. Um, but to me, it's just super important, super important. Mm -hmm.
There's an interesting concept I heard in a podcast a while ago about the progression of men that I want to talk to, to you guys about, get, get that topic going. It talks about knight, prince, king, and emperor. Kind of all men go through those different stages. <clears throat> kind of like you hear girls always like, oh, I want my knight in shining armor, <laughs> you know? And, and the concept, at least my interpretation of those steps, it's kind of like the knight is the adolescence into their early 20s. You're out there, you're having fun, you're, you're you know, hollering at women and, and trying to make your money and this and the other thing. That's when you're a knight. But sometimes the knight realizes that he doesn't own anything for himself. And that's when the knight transitions into a prince. And the prince starts building something, wanting to have something to build. And when that is built, he could become a king. And that transition from the prince to the king is what we usually call the, the midlife crisis. Because, hmm. hey, you're a prince. You made all this money. You built all this stuff. Now you want to enjoy it. But you're a king. Sometimes, as a king, you have a queen. You have a prince of your own to take care of. But the emperor, being kind of the, the top part, talks about building out more than that. After you're a king and you have a queen, an emperor is taking care of more than just his own castle. An emperor has a lot more responsibility. So I think the emperor is kind of like, after you've done everything for your family, how are you using your skills and what you've built for the people around you, the community, the world? How are you going to be an emperor of, of your life? What do you guys think of that progression and how, how do you interpret that? Um, I could say for my life, interpreting that was, I mean, I, I love the analogy of how you used each of those because for me it was, I was this low totem pole star starving artist, you know, just trying to make it in this world and trying to figure out my life. Um, and then you think of uh, the, the knight in shining armor, getting to that point for me was, um, you know, I'm an artist. Most women, they, you know, it's a, it, maybe even a fantasy, right, to be with an artist, right? <laughs> and that knight in shining armor coming along, but there's no security in an artist, right? Most movies you've seen, I don't think you've seen the girls stay with the artist, right? Hmm. It's usually a, an affair or this or whatever it is. Hmm. Um, bad analogy for me in my life, but, <laughs> um, you know, just, just for me as an artist and a hopeless romantic, that, that Night in Shining Armor was like key for my life. Like, that's gotta happen for me. Like, I gotta be that some, something, somebody for someone. Um, and then when you get that, career and everything else, you know, from the starving artist to becoming something that I think people look at to you, uh, whether it's good or bad, right? And then transitioning that into um, being that king, having that career, finding what it is you love to do. For me as art, it was finding the, the speed painting, finding um, people that actually enjoyed m what I do, because art is a very subjective, right? Some people like it, some people don't. You can't please everyone. Um, but being able to be the king of my domain, having a marriage, and then you know having a queen and then a, a prince, you say, I, I have my own little prince now. And, um, but going through those steps for me was, okay, when you become that king and, and go to the, being the emperor, because I don't really see myself as a king or an emperor, but the analogy that you're using, I think fits perfectly with most people in their life. and and. For me, it's, it's impacting other people, right? You have this domain that you take care of. I'm able to provide for my family, take care of my family, and through art. Um, but I think there's a purpose in what I do, and that is hopefully touching people through art. And in my studio, back to our other conversation, is, is you know people come in, and if I'm not authentic with them, they're not gonna wanna talk to me, hmm. you know? But when they see a video of you or they see what you do, they, they wanna know you and your story. And when you tell that your story, I mean, mine's from, like I said, a starving artist, hurting my leg, moving to Greenville, having surgery, to a lot of people that love and cared for me, to um, being able to have a studio and, and travel and do all these wonderful, crazy things. Um, but come back to the point of, okay, this is not my purpose. My purpose is to hopefully touch people's lives through what it is I'm, I'm doing. So when you say emperor, it is the emperor taking care of the people, right? Mm -hmm. 
Now, yeah, my feelings might get hurt here and there, but I'm called to love people, to engage people, um, to hear their story, to be authentic, right? Share my heart and, and listen to their heart. Uh, so for me, an emperor would be that, would be taking care of the people around you, inspiring other young artists, right? Inspiring other people that you can, you know, you pay attention in kindergarten during finger painting class, you never know where it's going to take you, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you might be a halftime show, you might be, you know, Mercedes-Benz Stadium, wherever it is, you know? and inspire these young minds. So funneling all that back to being a man, being a man is inspiring other people to get to that point. Because um, success is also in the eye of the beholder, right? Mm -hmm. so sex, su success to me is literally doing what you love, what you're passionate about, and making a difference and have purpose in it. And uh, you know, money comes, money goes. It doesn't matter how much you have. What matters is what you do with it. There's my two cents. I like that. And it's, it's a perfect analogy for kind of what's going on in my life uh, right now. Like, I feel like the analogy of the night, to me, it's like the night's the one that's like hungry and out there and like hustle, 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 build, 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 like, you know, just nonstop. I'm a little bit unclear on what, go over the Prince aspect again for me, because that's what I'm trying to yeah. figure out. So the night is actually kind of before the hustle. Okay. The night is, I'd say more of the adolescent state. That could be okay. anywhere from 14 to 22, wherever you might be. Okay. Mm. Uh, I think the Prince is the stage where it's like, okay, you don't own anything, so you Got want it. to build, build something. Build, build, okay. You know? Gotcha, so then, yeah. So Prince being hustle, hustle, build, build, grow. And then for me, this transition from, from prince to king, it's the perfect analogy, and I'm glad you used it because this phrase that I've been saying so much lately is the king eats first, the king eats first, the king eats first, over and over and over, the king eats first. And it's back to that oxygen mask, mm -hmm. the king eats first. And I realized over the last 18 months, as I've been pretty much documenting my entire life on social media, that I've been working 16, 18, 20 hours a day, putting all this stuff out there for freaking strangers, like people that I don't even know. And being away from home, 238 nights in a hotel last year, I'm gone like three to four nights a week. Um, and what I was doing was putting everyone else first, myself second, my family third. And this transformation that I've had over the last six, seven weeks is just realizing how absolutely backwards and my my thought process, man, is it's it's got two two different ladders. There's a family ladder, and then there's a community ladder. The family ladder uh, it starts with yeah, college and my family sent me to college. I'm doing my thing. I'm getting it done. I'm having fun. I'm meeting girls. Then there's post college, which is kind of the prince phase. Like okay. It's time for me to get together. King phase is the family man phase. I'm, I'm, I'm finding my wife, significant other. We may or may not be having kids. We're building that. And then the emperor phase, actually in my head, is like how I remember my grandfather before he passed, like the patriarch phase of my family. It's like he's a grandfather, but he has, he has two kids. He has six grandkids. And his worry is with everyone. It's, you know, that's why, you know, you roll with me, man. Like, me and Ted have a great conversation about my latest little sleeve edition. It's uh, my biggest fear, me and Ted, I never come, my biggest fear is running out of time to do all the things that I, I wanted to, to do in life. And most of them are like making sure my kids are, are good, making sure my brothers are, are set and they're good and they're okay. That, those are the thoughts, and it's like, man, there's only so, many t there's only so much time. So, but that's the patriarch emperor phase of a family. Now, if you look at it from a community organization, the first two phases are pretty similar. You know, college, buck wild, and then you, you grow up and you're like, okay, I want to be a, worth, a worthwhile member of society. I want to contribute something, I want to do something, I want to figure something out, I want to get a job and do something. In that king phase, you're like, I'm doing something, but if I actually do my own thing or do something on a bigger level, I can bring some people 
with me. You may still be working in another organization, but you, I'm going to step it up. I'm going to do it. I'm going to hire some of my friends that are struggling, but I know they have potential. I'm going to do it. And then that emperor phase is that I've done it. Now I can outreach. People will hear what he said, like, you got to take care of yourself. And they will going to look at him like, ah, uh, ah. Uh. They have no clue what he's even referring to. It's, it's, I love using the gym's analogy. If you're sick, can you work? No. If you're tired every day at two o'clock, can you have an efficient work day? No. Freaking take care of yourself so that you have that energy, that availability, that strength, that effort to give to the rest of the universe. Because if you don't have it, you can't give it. Hence, you have to take care of yourself first to be in. There's no other way to do it. So we talk a lot about the different concepts with, concepts with the modern man, responsibility, kind of outreach, having a network of other men to talk, to be vulnerable with, and also being selfish. Also, being selfish to be selfless mm -hmm. is part of that responsibility thing, like right? taking care of your own so you can pay it forward. I do want to talk about the topic of protection and protecting your own because to tell the story that really I've been obsessing over this for the past couple of weeks me and my girlfriend were sleeping in the middle of the night we hear a loud crash and we get up and she's like what was that I had no idea what it was so I'm gonna go check it out as the man I think in that situation it's my job to check it out so I go out I stick my head out and I'll be honest with you guys I was scared I was scared, I don't know what I'm walking out into. We checked the whole apartment, come to find out it was just my key ring that fell. But that moment st sticks with me because when we talk about the night and the prints or whatnot, to be honest, most of my life, it was just me and I was single. I didn't really have anything to lose. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason I was scared that night was because I didn't know who was in my apartment, if someone was there, and I was worried about my ability to protect my girlfriend, who's in the other room, my ability to protect myself and my apartment. Like I have something to lose now. So because of having something to lose and the things that I'm building with my career or whatnot, I'll be honest, I size everybody up. Not in a, oh, I'm gonna fight you type thing, but knowing that we live in a world where someone's going to come after your cookie one day, how do I protect you? How do I protect myself from the cookie monster? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'll be honest. Both of you guys, I'm going for the legs. <laughs> I'm going for the legs. I'm going for the legs. But I, I think the concept of protection, and, and I do want to be clear because I think nowadays everyone thinks, oh, I'm a man, I, want, I, I could fix my car, I could fix what's broken in my house, I could do this. Being able to do that doesn't mean you're a man, but knowing how to get it done, I think. Mm -hmm. if, if I don't know how to change my oil, but the work I put in allows me to pay someone to change my oil. I took care of it. As the man, I solved the problem. So I'm not necessarily at the saying as a protector, you have to be Jackie Chan. <laughs> but what do you guys think of protecting what you own? How do you do that? That's the concept. Well, he already hit, Tyler just he gave it to you. So be selfish. If you feel like, if you're talking about physical protection, because there's you're talking about your cookie can be your career, which is a whole nother level of protection than protecting your physical home and the people with you. I'm, I'm pretty calm. I'm, I'm confident. I mean, I'm ex military guy. You know, I had some deployments. I'm confident, man. You come to my house, it's the wrong place. It is not the place. I mean, I'm just, I'm confident in that. If my girlfriend is there, if my kids are there, I'm confident in that but protecting like, I'm a financial advisor. Dude, every time I go to a networking event, there's 50 of me. You wanna talk about protecting your cookie? Bro, that is a, a monster. But the same thing with you, you're protecting your cookie because you're building a brand. Your brand is Ted Fayton. He's an artist, so if somebody wants, wants to get a painting, there's 50 artists, why are they going to him? You have to build your brand. Make sure you're the expert. And you know what? Same thing on this side, same way as learning how to protect yourself, be it learning jujitsu, learning how to shoot, whatever that is, you gotta be selfish. 
got to be selfish and put the time in to you. Invest in yourself more and more and more and more. If you invest in yourself, if you learn to box, how much more competent are you if you have a problem? And you're just like, well, I know how this is going to end. Boop, boop. It's but you, because you invested in yourself. But maybe the problem was because someone was messing with your girlfriend. The selfishness just turned into selflessness. And you know, we're not about that, 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 that physical violence, but your career, taking more courses in, you know, in speaking and whatever, whatever makes an anchor man better. So when that job comes up, damn, Ted is a good anchor man. We're gonna hire him over that guy. But you were selfish, because you were working on Ted. But you weren't selfish, because now, Hey baby, you know that job that I want, that you know you wanted to go to Miami? Well, I got that Miami job. Now we can go. I can provide and we can do that. So you have to be selfish in certain aspects. You have to protect everything you got. So, and, and, you know, you got a lot of cookies. And it takes some selfishness to protect all of them. But by being, by investing in yourself, you're building something that can take care of others. Hey, we're about an hour in. I just wanted to let you know that. But wipe your eye on this side, because when you look back at it, you don't want people thinking you're crying the whole time. Yeah, you got you got a little bit of a wet spot on that side. And when I look at it in the camera, it looks like you got a tear running down your face. So, so. Light no shame in it, but... <laughs> It's a safe place. It's a safe place. We got emotional. <laughs> hey, we're here for you, though, either way, man. Yeah. Yeah. Did I get it? What? That good cocoa butter, man. Y'all need to get some. Keep your skin. Keep your skin. <laughs> so I think I think there's just to throw a curveball um, or a different perspective. I think there's an interesting aspect of protection when it comes to a relationship because your wife, your girlfriend, they want to feel safe, right? Mm -hmm. So it's important to provide a safe environment. Like that's that to me is number one. But protection also provides a certain level of confidence. Like with, when you've built yourself into a position where you feel like you can protect whatever it is, whether it's physically, emotionally, whether it's your business, whatever that is, provides a level of confidence that when you walk in the room, people can feel. Like people can feel when you walk in a room and you're, and you're 100% okay with whatever happens, happens, mm -hmm. and you know you're gonna be all right. Um, and that sounds like it's just, <laughs> aggressive on the physical side um, but it's not just that like when you walk into a room and you got a boardroom and you got 12 people sitting there and you've got this, this air about you this confidence of you like you can handle uh, yourself um, that's powerful that's powerful and that's with me like that's the my main priority when it comes to like the body like I want people when I walk in I want people to be like hmm okay like Something's different, you know. It's just that immediate, that first impression, um, and that has to do, a lot to do for me with discipline. Discipline, like with a financial advisor, like you're the perfect image of it. Like, a fin find me a fat financial advisor is very quickly you can find them. But I'm like, why in the world would I hand? Why? Why would I? Why would I hand you the responsibility of managing my money when you can't even manage your body? Like that literally, it, it literally. It drives me absolutely crazy. Like I, I did this conference call. We have 85 life insurance agents across the country, and I did this webinar one time. And I just straight up told them, I was like, nobody wants to buy from a fat guy. I'm like, it's just, I'm like, and I'm sorry because I know a lot of you are fat. I'm like, but it is what it is. Like I just, I don't trust you. I'm sorry, I don't trust you. Like if you can't, if you can't be responsible and disciplined with your diet and with your with your working out, why in the world would I believe that you're gonna be disciplined with my money? Like yeah. it's just, it's crazy. Um, but back to the original concept, I mean, providing safety is huge. Mm. Because back to when you were talking about opening up to your, your spouse, like that's the person that you go to, um, there's certain areas to me that are sacred in that safe space. Like I'll talk to my wife about concerns and problems, like financially but there's a certain element that I want her to feel safe like I don't want her to feel like there's something that she needs to be worried about you know what I mean mm -hmm. because and, and, and this could be wrong like this could be just me and, and I'm and I'm airing <laughs> something that you guys are about to destroy but there's something to me about providing that safety for her to feel comfortable and I don't want I don't want her to worry mm -hmm. about anything quite frankly um, 
so we'll talk and we'll discuss things that are going on and I can open up to her, but there's those certain areas where I'm gonna to talk to a, a business partner, a friend, and not talk to her about. And it's not keeping it away from her, it's just keeping her safe. Obviously, if it's something that's gonna affect her, it's, it's, on, it's on the table. Um, but there's that, that aspect of providing a safe place that to me is so important uh, in a relationship. It's huge. I, I agree with you there. I probably would do the same thing. I, I, I don't know if, like, if I was, everything was just crashing down, I don't know if I'd go to my wife and yeah. freak her out as well, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would go to my wife first if it came down to just me personally, if yeah. I was struggling with something. Yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, protection, man, it's, 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 it's pretty broad, right? Yeah. Um, you know, for me and my family, I, I think for me it started out, uh, You know, coming along my journey was I couldn't pr I couldn't actually protect and provide for myself, you know, for so long. Mm -hmm. And then in meeting my wife, and then um, she had two kids of her own, and it just scared me to death. Like, how am I going to take care of her and these kids when I've spent my whole life trying to figure out how to take care of myself? Yeah. And it hasn't happened. And I think it all comes down to what you said, discipline. Um, I know you were talking about discipline for your body, for yourself. But for me, it's discipline with your work ethic, mm. um, with what I do. Uh, I meet a lot of athletes, and I grew up playing basketball. Like, that was my entire life, was basketball. And I knew I was good enough, but I knew I wasn't good enough in, in the area of discipline and work ethic mm. that it takes to be a pro athlete. Now, I meet some of these guys, I see the behind the scenes, and they, you know, they have amazing work ethic, discipline, like Sunday football, you know, you watch these guys in the NBA, LeBron and them, I mean, it doesn't just happen, hmm. right? They work out physically, they work on a shot a million times, right? They work on dribbling, everything. It takes work. And so for me as an artist, and I always say this, it's, it's like the great uh, lyricist and, and, and uh, wordology, I guess, whatever you want to call them, Macklemore, right? <laughs> Macklemore said the greats were great because they paint a lot. He didn't say they were great because they're so talented. He said they're great because they paint a lot. And for me as an artist, that paint relates to me. I realize I gotta work my tail off. I'm gonna outwork anybody. So when it comes to maybe even other artists, um, they're not gonna outwork me. I'm gonna outwork them when it comes to my, my field. And when I get to where I feel like I'm being outworked, I get myself in a little space of, woe is me, what am I doing? And I shouldn't be. My wife's a, a, a great encourager. She's great to build me up, lift my head up as much as I can. Uh, and she's easy to pop it and say, yo, you need to humble yourself and mm -hmm. calm down, you know? <laughs> so because of that love I have for my family, I do want to protect and provide for them. Um, and I'm talking about my career aspect. So that brought me to a point of, I can, I can protect my family on a, a financial and career level, um, and I know that I have to keep doing that. On a physical level, listen, if I'm in an aisle, I mean, uh, not an aisle, but a, an uh, alleyway, <laughs> me and my wife walk in and some dude jumps out at us, dude, I'm stepping behind my wife. You know? <laughs> <laughs> She's Mexican and she will kick your tail in a heartbeat. She'll shoe off. Right, right, she will, she'll cut you in a heartbeat. <laughs> No, but the, the physical aspect, yeah, I think we all, as men, we, we, you know, that's our responsibility to protect our families, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I think if you don't feel like you can, then you're at a weak point, and that can lead to all kinds of stuff. Yeah. So uh, for me, it's, it's, yeah, I want to protect my family. Like, you gave, you gave a great example. There's times at night where I hear something. My first instinct is, like, I'm just dreaming. I want to go back to sleep. But because of my wife and my my three-year-old son, yeah, it, it, it worries me. You know, I need to I need to get up and make sure I'm the one that steps out of the room, not my wife, right? Yeah. Yeah. And some women might want to take on the role and say, no, I got this, right? Mm -hmm. But, so she's a shooter, boy. right? I was about to say, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm well Have some more expertise, <laughs> but. That's great that you even, the fact that you'll say that is great. It's what we're talking about. It's, it's maximizing your household. Your household isn't my household. 
I know in my household, well, something, something comes up. It's time for Charles to go Donkey Kong on somebody. That's, that's just, that's what it is. There's no, there's not another answer in my household. You know, there may be another answer in your household, but your, your thing that you said, and it's, it's what I harp to whenever I talk to somebody, they want to do some business mentoring, whatever. The thing that you said about weakness, we all have them. There's not a person on earth who does not, and when you're talking about protecting it, it's addressing weakness. Some people like, go in on your weaknesses, nah, I don't believe that. I'm gonna take my strengths, maximize them, and build my, my kingdom on my strengths. But you have to address your weaknesses. You have to address them and make a way to compensate or fix them. If you know what, you have scheduling problems. Dude, there's five million apps on your phone, that's no longer an excuse in the universe. Build habits that fix weaknesses or dress them as best as possible. And that will help you protect. And that is huge with everybody I talk to. Like, well, this is a consistent problem for you. Do you ever, have you addressed this? Well, I, no. Until you address this, it's going to continue to be a problem. You may never be able to figure this out on your own just flat out because it is a personal weakness. Somewhere in your DNA, this does not work for you address it. Figure out how to knock it out. Figure out how to check it. Put something else in your scheduler where you can fix it. You gotta do something. And that, that he said, dude, it, if you have a weakness, you gotta address it, man. You can't just let it dangle. Because that will get your, your cookie snatched faster than anything else. Because if I want your cookies and I know your weakness, I'm going right there. Just like a boxer. A suspect to a left hook. I've never thrown a left hook in my life, but I best believe for this fight, I'm gonna throw 10,000 before we get in the ring. So we talked a lot about a lot of different topics, and I know we're like an hour or so into it, so just wanna be respectful of your time and everything. Wrapping it, wrapping it up, kind of asking the same question we started with and wanting to answer that, and, and I could start talking about like the modern man, the more we kind of talked, because my concept of the modern man changes every single time we get in conversations like this and we could talk for hours but it really hones in to a dedication to growth and and personal responsibility i think in order to be a man you have to have a purpose and build upon something whatever your skills and whatever your your purpose might end up being is really going to be the the vehicle you use to provide for yourself, for your family, and even give back to the community in the future. So being a modern man is just, for me, I think commitment to growth, to operate at your full potential and take care of those that you love. I had to sum it up. I agree, <laughs> I agree, I think it's great. I, I think it's, you're right. I mean, modern man, again, you, you can, Everyone has their own description of it, right? Um, but I think you hit on the head of responsibility and growth. Um, my motto is learn something new every day. And I think as a man, I think that's important to learn something new every day. Whether it's for me as I learn something about someone else, I learn something about business, I learn something about my craft, I read something that I didn't know, I learn about, you know, whatever it is. You learn something new every day because if you're not learning, you're burning and no one wants to burn, right? So modern day is, you, I guess you got to stay ahead of the game, right? I think it's interesting when, <clears throat> and I don't want to debunk the, the modern and the modern man, but it's all based on your frame of reference. Our fathers yeah. probably sat around and had a similar conversation, and I don't know if they classified themselves as what does it mean to be a modern man, mm. which is interesting as to us having that conversation conversation now the difference being now the technology and the things we have at the at our fingertips mm. give us the ability to do the most incredible things that other generations they can't even they couldn't even process and so it's knowing that it's trying to live up to our full potentials I think read somewhere that their definition of hell was one day meeting the person that they could have been had they lived up to their full potential and that's and that's scary super scary and so 
when you look at becoming the modern man, I think it's just becoming a man, you know? Like you talked about a certain age where like, and now all of a sudden you're a man. I don't know when that age is. And I don't know if it's a certain pain you have to go through or a certain success you have to experience. I don't know what, I don't know what it means when all of a sudden you become a man. I mean, having a child, that's probably a great definition of, mm -hmm. what, of, of, of a event where you become a man real fast. Um, <laughs> But I know a lot of fathers that aren't men as well. So, so, so I don't know what it means to even be a man other than the uh, anatomical or whatever the word <laughs> that is. But, um, but I think it's, it's that. It's living up to your full potential, um, not running out of time, like you said, Charles. Um, to be at the, at the end of your day and know that you did the most that you could have done uh, for the most that you could have, uh, the most people that you could have done it for. And, um, yeah, man. But I think if we sat here and had this conversation tomorrow, we'd all come up with different answers. Absolutely. It's, it's, yes. a, it's, a, it's definitely a moving target. That's for sure. Probably, I would love to say I was brilliant and I made this up, but I didn't. Uh, it's not survival of the fittest. It's survival of the best adapted. The guy, the guy who controls social media seems like in this, in this universe controls the world. Probably ain't the fittest, but he's the best adapted to the world we live in. And that's, that's the modern man. Who's best adapted to this world? And that's, that's all you need to know. Who's that, who's that guy? Who can juggle having a wife, social media, being physically fit, running a company, raising a kid, Maybe he doesn't run a company, maybe he just raises a kid because that's the way his world works. And that's it, be the best adapted. Honestly, these guys are the perfect example. And I think part of being the modern man is surrounding yourself with other people that challenge you. I don't think any of us have the answer to the modern man, but what we can say as the solution, giving the solution is looking for it. The journey is the destination. So find yourself a group of men that you can be vulnerable with, talk with, share your problems with. And if you have a group like these guys, I think you guys will be all right. You did that without a teleprompter. Unbelievable. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> that was great. Live Ted is the real Ted. <laughs>